Um, eventually, do you think that it will replace the GRE as an entrance assessment exam for PA school? <laughs> it's, it's, um, I was reflecting on when I took the GRE when I was going through my PhD, before my PhD program, it's like, I felt kind of thumped by that, but um, the GRE is a very different exam. Hope you guys did not welcome back to my channel. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. So as promised, I have with me today one of like the driving forces of the PA CAT. And so I know you guys have a lot of questions about it and we're going to get right into it. But before we do, I want to just give you the history on Dr. Massey um, and I guess how he's able to talk about the PA CAT and I guess why it would be valid for you all to listen. So Dr. Massey has a PhD and a PAC. He has practiced for 27 years in PA education, including holding leadership positions in four different PA programs. Currently, he holds the position of a tenured professor and director of, Cent of the Central Michigan University Physician Assistant Program. Dr. Massey has worked clinically in the area of family medicine, emergency medicine, and international third world medicine, which is so cool. Um, Dr. Massey is also an accomplished researcher and author, having presented nationally and internationally more than 75 times. Dr. Massey has published more than a dozen research articles and textbooks published by F.A. Davis and used by PA students to prepare for certification exams. Dr. Massey has served as the co principal investigator of the PA CAT research project since early 2018. So he has done a lot and he is actually qualified to talk about this. So I've given him a list of questions that I've come up with and some of you all have asked and we're going to just kind of get right into those questions um, that you all have been asking about this PACAT um, and how I like to call it the PA CAT. So thank you so much, Dr. Massey, for joining me today on my that, channel. That, thank you, Adana. Um, oh, you're welcome. Uh, I just really quickly, just could you briefly tell me about the third world medicine? Because I have not heard about that, and I think it's a really interesting. Um, sure, ab absolutely. Um, d during my career, um, I've I've worked um, both clinically and um, in, uh, educationally in the country of Haiti and Belize. Um, I spent a year working in Haiti developing a physician extender program there. Um, so I've had some experience in those two countries. I've also gone to Costa Rica. So it's been one of my passions along the way. Um, and what, what, I guess, are they called? Are they called a physician extender um, in, in Haiti? Is that what their title would be? They're not actually. They're, they're, well, it, it depends on the institution, but um, there's different names for them. Um, I did travel to Africa a couple times in the last three years. And in Africa, Ghana, for example, I'm involved with a project there. They call them physician um, uh, clinical associates there. In South Africa, it's clinical associates. So it depends on the country. Um, there's analogs of PAs throughout the world now, which is sometimes something our, us Americans don't realize that the first true physician extender program was actually in Katumbo, Ghana in 1959. So it's an interesting concept. Giving us some history here. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the first question. Can you briefly share the history of this exam? So like the who, what, when, where, why? Um, you know, first of all, I, I joined Exam Master as the co-principal investigator um, in early 2018. I, I know that before that, um, Exam Master staff and executive staff have looked, we're looking at the PA um, the admissions exam concept for probably at least five years. So they were studying it, looking at it. Um, there, there's been some call and some discussion about it among different circles pre previous to that. And in 2018, it was still kind of in the conceptual stage. And I, I was asked to jump on the, the project because of my research work involving predictive factors. So for example, I've done some research involving how to predict PAN's performance. So it was, a, it was a logical kind of, um, you know, step for me. And, and so the, the um, CEO of Exam Master asked me to step on to the project. And so since then, um, we've added several, uh, like for example, a, psych, a psychometrician, um, other people involved with the project. And the first, the first um, analog of the exam was launched during the research phase, which um, actually began in, um, uh, summer of 2018. 
so you know, so so really, it was the first time that the exam was offered um, to actual PA students. So during the last two years, um, the exam has been researched. It has been stress tested, and so it's gotten to the point where it has enough statistical validity to be able to begin offering in in 2020 this year. So that's kind of like a very brief overview of the process. Um, I mean, uh, exam, um, Matt Bader, the executive director of Exam Master, could probably give more detailed, like, um, you know, historical perspectives prior to that. But that's that's been my involvement. Um, so I'll I'll wait for the other questions. But that's kind of like the the who, what, where, why of the process um, as far as the PA cap. And you said that it was tested with PA students. So um, in 2018, so was this like first year PA students, second year PA students? Right. Did you, how, how did you all test this? Um, um, th there's actually the, the um, research protocol for the PA CAT actually is online. Um, it can be found if you Google it. Um, I, I know there's been probably almost a thousand reads of that. And, and so the, the, re the research protocol describes phase one, phase two. So phase one actually was testing the exam on newly matriculated PA students. So during that phase, um, students who began the program during the first week, usually during orientation, were offered the exam at that time. Realize that when you research an instrument like this, obviously you can't administer it to prospective PA students because again, there's, there's ethics involved with that. And there, you know, there's an institutional review board that had to approve this process. Um, phase two of the of the exam or the research protocol was actually to what's called stress test the exam, and that was to test the exam on students who were interviewing in PA programs. So between the two phases, now we're approaching probably 2,200 students who have taken the exam. Okay. Um, part of part of um, what the concept of what's called the uh, psychometrician and psychometrics of this exam is to look at basically how students perform and how they perform in each individual individual question and whether or not um, other factors such as prerequisite GPA, other factors might also correlate with this exam. We're also looking at data related to the end of first year PACRET now um, in terms of how well the two variables will correlate. Um, the phase one, which is the research phase I mentioned before, will be concluding um, this spring in which we'll gather the last of the data. Um, the first phase um, data, which looks at the PA CAT and the um, admissions prerequisite GP, GPA, science GPA, et cetera, will be published um, in the Internet Journal of Allied Health Practice in April, if people want to look at that. Uh, we plan to publish the second phase as well, uh, hopefully at the end of 2020 or early 2021. So that's kind of like the, the, the process. This in accordance with PAEA, since it's, um, you know, PA education, like does PAEA have any stake in this at all? Yeah, yeah, good, really good question. Um, no, PAEA is, has been neutral about this. Um, it's interesting, I mean, I've been involved with PAEA committees. I was on the board of directors at one point. So I've been involved for 15 years, PAEA very closely. This is the first time there's been a project of this enormity that wasn't governed or administered by PAEA, okay? So the PAEA leadership, um, you know, this is an external, you know, exam, much in like the MCAT might be, much in like the GRE will be. So really, it doesn't really impact the, P, you know, PA education per se. So um, it's something that among PA educators, the PA CAT has become well known and there's been much discussion. So at the PAEA conference this past year, um, we, we had a number of conversations with PA faculty. So, so the, the answer to your question, um, it, it's not in accordance with PAEA because it wouldn't be appropriate to be to do so because it's not being governed by, it's not being um, administered by PAEA. Okay. OK, will this test become mandatory? And again, much in like the other admissions exams that already exist, it will depend on the program, okay? So programs decide what admissions exam they want to use. There's some out there, there's one called the CASPER out there that exists. 
there, of course, the GRE, um, as of a couple of years ago, was about 51% of the programs used it. That's starting to drop a little bit. I think like less than 10% of the programs now require MCAT, which isn't a good fit really because the PA students don't take all the prerequisites for it. Um, so it's going to be depending upon the program. And, you know, much like other grassroots processes, I mean, it's going to be like, how does it work in programs? And eventually the research that's published from this process. Um, I mean, we have, we have conjectures and speculations, but, um, you know, this year it might be, you know, less than 10% of the programs and up in, in um, future years it might go up to 30, 40% of the programs, but that's going to depend on the program. How many schools are currently requiring or recommending the PA CAT this cycle and then next cycle? Um, okay. I know you mentioned about 10%, but yep. is there like a number that you have that you can we're, give we're, us? We're, we're not going to have the absolute number until probably the 1st of May because of the fact that we, we know of about, we know of 10 programs that are adopting for 2020 for this cycle. Okay. Um, but, you know, the, 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 um, the process of adoption will depend on the, 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 um, the, the, you know, the CASPA cycle and what dates and that kind of stuff. So we'll have a better viewpoint of that around 1st of May of how many programs have adopted this year. Is there going to be maybe on like the PA CAT website a list of the programs that are there? Because, you know, as a pre-PA student, it's already difficult as it is trying to source out like the requisite requirements for different programs. Um, so just having a place for them to go to to see if I'm applying to like the University of Tampa or Central yeah. Michigan, yeah. Um, do I need, is it recommended that I take the PA CAT? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, and I, I think my my guess is it will be. Um, that's something that actually I will bring to Matt Bader, the executive director, the uh, CEO, because I think it's a good idea. Um, so it's it's something that I think would make sense. Now I realize also that the websites of programs during you know during the the period prior to closing of the application phase will then start to post you know whether the PA CAT is required. And I know that's been some concerns by students, like uh, that's happening late in the game. Yeah. Um, but but it, it's it's a phase in process, and um, there's no good time to adopt something new. But um, you know, having been involved with PA admissions for you know this is the 29th year for me, I can tell you that um, you know as long as you're not requiring a new class at the last minute, you know, adopting a test where there's still months to to take the exam. I, I don't think that's too late in the game for most programs. So it, it's kind of like it's weighing that and, and also reaching out to individual students from that program that's being so adopted. So with respect to that question, just, this is this, you know, a, kind of like a subset, I guess you can say. So um, for instance, the GRE has like several different dates that you can take the exam. Um, now when the PA CAT opens in May, um, and since you guys are test, you know, actually like rolling it out this cycle, are there going to be several different test days that it can be taken throughout the year, even for like those later applications that are right. January or March? <laughs> my my understanding, Adana, is that it's going to be offered at the pro, it's going to be offered at the Prometric test centers. There's five thousand test centers, and once it's once it starts um, at the Prometric centers, it will be available ongoing. So so I can't give you like is it every day. Is it every week? But it's going to be a number of different test dates available for prospective PA students. Okay. So it's going to be numerous times. You know, much in like if you schedule some of the other ex entrance exams, like the LSAT, um, GRE, etc., um, you have to sign up. You have to find the dates that are available for that center. But um, you know, once it once the, it rolls out, um, it should be offered multiple times. So it's not going to be like once. It's going to be multiple times. Okay. So I'm asking if you can uh, like just give a brief description on the details of the exam, like how long it is and how it's scored, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because those are questions that, you know, as a student going in to take an exam, you want to know like, well, if I get this grade or, you know, this score, where am I at, I guess, in terms right. of so, so the, the exam is going to have 225 questions okay. and, and um, just like, uh, like and, I, and I'm just going to use the analogy of the PANS for many years. Uh, and so the PANS used to be 360 questions 
and 60 questions were what's called field test questions. Um, I was a test writer for NCCPA a number of years ago, and that process um, you know, took place. So the PA cat will be the 225 questions. The 25 of the questions will be field test questions. So 200 questions will count you know, if for the scaled score. Okay. So, so that's what's gonna happen with that. Um, do you, is that what you want to know was the length or do you want more detail? Um, I mean, I think I mentioned the length to them before. Is it, how, how many, is it a minute a question? How, like, how are they it's a minute. A, it's, a, it's a minute a question. Okay. It's, it's based on this, you know, it's based, really based on the same formula in terms of um, how the NCCPA administers their, their exams. And, and um, the, the minute per question, um, there, there will be accommodations available. Um, so that, that's something that students will have to apply for as far as if they need accommodations. Okay. And that will be on a on a case by case basis. If they need double time, 1.5 time. So Okay. Is there currently a fee waiver or reduction program in place for applicants with a financial need? Yep. So Exam Master is pursuing that. And they're pursuing at the um, um, the state level um, and the national level. So you know working with APA, working with the state chapters. Um, they're, they're, we're working on criteria for, you know, for basically inclusion, criteria for how the students can apply for the waivers, okay? Um, so it's something that in 2020 will be in place. Okay, so how should one prepare for the exam or can you even prepare for this exam? So, for, so from, from my perspective, um, the exam is based upon the, the typical prerequisites that PA students take. And um, I know I, I've heard concerns that some students don't take organic chemistry. So, you know, so there's different variations of that. Um, so for that purpose, like the chemistry questions were, were made a bit more general to, to, so students who didn't take as much robust chemistry, you know, weren't necessarily penalized by that. Okay. Um, as of right now, Exam Master, as part of the price for the exam, will offer a free um, practice exam. So that's one way you can see kind of like how you would score. There's also some free downloadable materials that has the outlines of the exam in terms of what topics. Um, there's kind of taxonomies of the exam as well. Um, and where, where would they be able to find that? If they go to the, the PACAT website and they go to resources for, for applicants, for okay. test takers, they will find them there. Also, also add to that that, um, you know, just, you know, much like other exams, yes, I mean, they can, you know, students can review the, the overall topics on the exam. They can go back to their textbooks. They can go back to their courses. I mean, by the time you get to that point, you know, you're a junior, senior, it, it's been a while since general biology, you know, they can kind of, you, you can review the concepts, but, you know, you know the, the belief is, is that it will not require a robust time, like, you know, months of preparation because really it's meant to test what they absorb during their time as a pre, you know, in undergrad. So with respect to the studying and the scoring of the exam, um, since it's new, how would I, as a student, know that I did well or didn't, like, how, is, there, is there an option for that? I mean, because I'm, I'm not even really sure, I guess, on the scale, like what your scale is or, mm -hmm. you know, how it's scored in a sense. So how sure. would I know, like, if I get, I don't even know, like 300, that's a good score, or where I sit okay. with respect to other students that take Okay, take so, so, so several layers for that, but um, I know you took, and congratulations, by the way, you recently um, passed the pans. Yes, um, I did, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, the, the scale system really mirrors the pans. So the, the scale, the overall scale for the exam is 200 to 800, okay? okay. Um, then there's gonna be, you know categories um, in the exam that are that are going to be built in anatomy, physiology, um, chemistry, etc. And the scale score is based upon how the students scored based upon the pool. Okay, so in 2020, the students will receive a scaled score for those categories and the overall, and they will also receive a percentile marker, which means that you know based upon you know 5,000 students that have taken it before you, um, you scored you know above X percentage percentages of the candidates in the country. So much in like when you go, when you look at your own, like I think NCCPA reports it as deciles, um, we're reporting it as percentiles. It's, it's fairly simple that way. 
Um, there is not a cut score right now. In other words, there isn't like, this is the score that you have to achieve. At the program level, it's gonna be organically used in terms of um, looking at, you know, if the candidates are, you know, at this percentile in the country, how they might use that information. Um, we have general recommendations, but we're not, but, but it's not our responsibility, or, nor is it appropriate for exam master or the exam to dictate to programs how they use that information. Um, what, what students will know ahead of time is that they scored, you know, what percentage points above, below of the, of the test takers that they scored. And then the scaled scores are derived um, using, you know, the same model, what's called Roche model of, of test modeling, which is the same as, you know, the, the, the PANS. I mean, theoretically, you could, you could um, click on random questions and get a 300. Um, very few students will get an 800, just because um, with central tendencies, most students will score within kind of a, somewhat of a narrow range with, with that kind of exam. Is does this? Are you all participating with CASPA? So are we? Able, are they able to send their scores through CASPA? Is that going to be an option, or do they just get their score and then they send it to the particular program like by themselves? So, so um, Exam Master is working out the same arrangement that the GRE is used, which is um, when students will click on which which programs they're applying for, then it will be sent to the CAS to CASPA and CASPA will will make that available to the programs that um, that um, um, will that they apply to. There's also going to be like a transcript that, that will exist too. So it'll be made quite clear to students how that works. Okay. So when they go in to, apl to apply for the exam and take the exam, it'll show how that how that articulation with CASPA will work. So can you share with us how the PA CAT differs from the GRE and um, eventually, do you think that it will replace the GRE as an entrance assessment exam for PA school? <laughs> it's, it's, um, I was reflecting on when I took the GRE when I was going through my PhD, before my PhD program, it's like, I felt kind of thumped by that, but um, the GRE is a very different exam. Um, it, it's actually even changed now than the PA CAT. The PA CAT is based on the basic sciences and social sciences that students take during their program. So, so, the, so the GRE approach, the analytic approach, the verbal approach, is, it's a very different exam. I mean, it can't really be compared. Um, so so it, it's, it's, really more of a, it's really more of a basic science content-based exam versus a process exam or analysis of verbal, et cetera. What about uh, eventually replacing the GRE? Do you, you see know, that, that happening the, in the future? I mean, if I had a crystal ball, I would say over time, I think more programs will probably adopt it than, than not in the future. I mean, again, that's going to be up to the program. So, you know, programs will use admissions variables um, in various ways. And I'll tell you how I've used admissions variables is that you, you correlate the student's score with the academic performance in individual programs. You correlate those admissions variables with, say, Backrat, end of rotation exams, summative exams, and eventually PANS. So I think that you know some programs you know might continue with both. I'm not sure if they will or not, but um, it's the same process. I mean, they'll decide whether the GRE is not is not able to provide that information. And uh, and I yesterday I went on and just kind of reviewed some of the research literature about GRE and PA education, and what it's demonstrated has been inconsistent and it hasn't been very strong in terms of the relationship with academic performance. So it's been a bit wanting. Um, you know, there's, there's probably about a dozen articles written by PA educators and a dissertation I just read that looked at how well it worked. So at the end of the day, it's kind of like, what, what kind of tools can we, you, we as PA educators have in our arsenal to make the best selections? of the candidates. And, it, and it, I can tell you that it's not about weeding out students, it's about making sure the students in your program have the ability to be able to, um, you know, to be able to um, perform well in the program. And, and I, I can get into um, issues such as attrition remediation with you if you want, but I can tell you that from, from my viewpoint, I mean, I've spent the greater part of my career building remediation practices, and finding ways to predict performance and intervene so students can be successful. And to me, it's about, that's kind of an extension of that, of that conceptual framework because we want the students to be 
able to be successful and having worked with many students that got into the program and then just weren't able to get over the hump in terms of that first semester or two or they struggled through the program and then they struggled in the second year and then they ended up failing pans once or twice or more you know you just don't want that to happen and in programs despite best efforts you know can't make that difference sometimes so um, I, I, I believe in the exam I believe it'll be a a positive move forward it'll be a, another tool for PA educators and, and that's just my personal perspective so with respect to that I guess how does the PA cat measure prepays academic ability um, needed for the successful completion of PA school because I know that is like the, yep. that's what you all intend for it to do so. sure so um, the, the, I mentioned before in the interview about the first phase of research and so I'll, I'll kind of give you a little bit of what we found so far um, if you look at how well the PA CAT score corresponds with, for example, PA academic GPA and the end of PA or end of didactic year PAC rat, um, it's been pretty strong. So again, if you're familiar with Pearson correlation, um, that relationship, the relationship between the PA CAT score and the end of didactic year PAC rat is um, about a 0.55 to 0.6, depending upon the sample size. And if you compare at the program level, GRE is probably in the range of a 0.2 to 0.3. So it, it's, a strong, it's, it's a stronger relationship. Um, I have personally, because Central Michigan um, was one of the first programs to administer the exam to our students, I have personally um, analyzed my students in the second year now, their performance in the first year, and looked at those variables. And I'm very delighted to see that the the exam did have a very strong correlation with students' performance. So it, it's, it's, that's kind of how it works. It happens on a macro level because, you know, you look at research. And I would, I would guess that down the road, there are probably multi-program studies because, again, um, you know, there's only so far you can get with a piloted study. It's going to have to be, you know, research among PA, PA schools. Um, if, if people want to go in, into my Google Scholar, page which they could just google me ph PA, scott massey p pac phd um, i did some research with multi-program study involving pack rat and summative exams and that kind of collaborative process will take place and so that's a long answer to your question and that and that the the ability to use it is going to be at the program level and it's going to be on the collaborative level um, and it and that that's pretty much the same as how PAC rat was used, the end of rotation exams were used, um, and, and I'm sure originally how GRE had been used because um, it has to be pilot tested, it has to be used over time. So anyways, I, I apologize for going too deep on that, but I, I no, wanted to give okay. you... I want, so with respect to, I know this is about performance in PA school, but with respect to attrition rate, like just looking at the report that comes out from like PAEA, <laughs> Artition rate is not really that high. So what, I guess, like how, are you trying to have like no artrition at all? Because it's maybe like two to three students that like come out of PA programs each year, so. Well, yeah, remember you're looking at the means, okay? okay. And um, you know, some programs who have special, you know, special missions um, will admit more at risk students, okay? So that the attrition rate might be higher. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there should be zero attrition, you know, so, so I think, I think, my, you know, the philosophy of PA educators is we want all of our students to succeed. So if, if this exam helps to lower attrition from 6% to 0%, you know, that's great. But if, if it's a tool that helps with that. Um, the other thing that to consider is that this exam could actually provide some assistance to programs that have a mission specific focus where they want to admit students who have disadvantaged backgrounds, where it could lead to a pre-matriculation program where they could be assisted if their scores are lower. So in other words, try to preemptively help the students to, make, to help ensure success. So, so, I, so again, um, you know, I know that programs have sometimes struggled more in one years than others. Um, I've seen attrition rates as high as 10% in my career. I've seen attrition rates as low as, as 2% in my career. So it's gonna vary. 
Okay, so this is the last question. It says, can you address the concerns of those who feel that this exam may reduce the diversity of PAVE students? as they believe that standardized exams disproportionately disadvantages people of color, those with low socioeconomic status, and those with disabilities? Yeah, that's an excellent question. It's been a concern of the test committee and the, and the research team all along. And the best way that that can be addressed is, is within psychometrics. And so I'm, I'm just gonna apologize if I go too deep into this, but I wanna say um, when the exam is analyzed, and that will be, now and ongoing is that they will that the psychometrics will look at performance based upon those parameters like it, it depends on how much information we have about the the um, test takers but they will look for differences in performance they will they will be looking for differences in performance within questions to see if there's any questions that might be potentially an issue for that um, I, i'm also going to say that um, that that whole concept about diversity and everything we mentioned is a hot topic in PA education now um, because of the fact that programs, you know, they, they struggle with that. And, and some, of the, some of the issues that programs face is that we have, you know, the pass rate on the PANS is something that our accrediting body, the ARCPA, um, does not look kindly if the pass rates drop, okay? So programs are kind of between a rock and a hard place with that. But back to the discussion about the pre-matriculation concept. If you have students in those categories that say their scores are lower, there's an opportunity for programs to adopt a pre-matriculation process, which that's something that we've also talked about offering as part of this in the future, is that, you know, can that be a, a way to bridge the gap? You know, rather than just looking at it, it's like, it's not meant to eliminate any candidates. And that's going to depend on what how programs choose to use it, but um, to the best of the ability and looking at how the exam performs, that's where those types of um, concerns will be addressed. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Massey, for just taking the time out to sit down with me and answer all of these questions. You did amazing. And so now I want to give you the opportunity, just if you have any last words of encouragement for those that are like chittering their teeth <laughs> that this test is coming or anything that you want to address that maybe we didn't have time to address or sure. even ask the questions. Um, sure. The floor is yours. Absolutely. I, I, I've taken some time to go, you know, into some of the blogs um, and, and look at some of the questions, and, both on yours and others. And I think some of the students are concerned about, you know, I think there's been comments about money. There's been comments about, you know, the cost to students. And I, um, the cost of the PA CAD, I mean, the the center fee is wrapped into the cost, so it's not significantly more than than GRE. Um, I, I guess you know that that's that's an issue that I guess you have to look at the big picture, and I'd a, I'd ask that students kind of or prospective students try to look at that in terms of how might that exam be helpful to you in the future. Um, I, I believe that we're trying to address some of the issues that you mentioned before. Um, you know, we're human beings, we're trying our best. Um, and at the end of the day, this is about trying to promote success in students. It's not about eliminating students, okay? Realize that, you know, this is my 29th year in PA education. And um, when programs are faced with, you know, say hundreds of applications, um, is there a way when when you have so many applications with almost the same credentials? I mean, what do you do? Um, and that that's hard because programs have limited resources. Um, they they can't interview every single candidate. So some so I think that it's better to use something like PA Cat rather than GRE to make those discriminations. You know, so it's a little bit of a better tool, I think, because some programs have used GRE for that purpose in the past. So I think just keep that in perspective. Um, th that's really the key things I wanted to say. Um, you know, we, you know, myself, you know, I, I'm, I, my career in PA education has been about, like I said, it's been about student success. And I wouldn't be involved with this project if I didn't believe that it was going to be a positive towards student success. So that's my, my last comments. Thank you again. Thank you so much for doing this interview. I really appreciate it. And I know that all of the subscribers and followers will appreciate it as well. Just getting some of the, the nitty gritty 
information that's not on the surface um, of the website. So thank you awesome. so much. Awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, you're welcome. Special thank you to Dr. Massey. I really appreciate you sitting down and answering these questions for all of us who are interested in just learning more about the PA cat. If you have any other questions that were not addressed in this video, please leave them in a the comment section below. Um, I know that again, this can be very like nerve wracking. It's a new assessment that's coming in, but just encouragement that you guys will get through it. It is things that you're already aware of in terms of your undergraduate degree. So if you go to the website and look at the resources tab, there will be information that will help you study or refresh your mind um, for the content areas on this exam. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Please like this video if you like it. Subscribe and follow me on Instagram at Adana the PA. And I will talk to you guys next time. Bye!